Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and it is time once again for another spotlight on Warner Archive. As you know, from time to time, we like to shine a light on the Warner Archive collection and highlight and look at some of the awesome releases that are constantly coming out from Warner Archive each and every month. And since our last Warner Archive Spotlight, we've gotten our hands on a whole bunch more cool new releases that we are just dying to talk with you guys about, including the highly anticipated Tex Avery Screwball Classics Volume 1. That Volume 1 is very important. We're going to get to all this in just a second. Here at the top, I want to say, what is Warner Archive? Warner Archive is a distribution arm of Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers has an incredibly deep vault of titles, uh, including thousands and upon thousands of movies, TV shows, and cartoon theatrical shorts. And uh, Warner Archive is a way for them to get uh, maybe more fan-based films, you know, stuff that might not be million sellers, uh, but for, for the film fan to get that directly in the hands of the customer. And uh, it's also worth noting that every single Warner Archive Blu-ray is pressed, not burned. So with that out of the way, let's dig into these amazing titles, starting with the Tex Avery Screwball Classics Volume 1. Uh, in the short time that I've had this and have been uh, watching these cartoons, I, I, I turned to social media to kind of help promote it and to just say I'm so excited. And, and my line is that it feels like Christmas, and I'm not exaggerating. That is how I feel. To have these famous Tex Avery cartoons that are represented on this volume, there are 19 cartoons on this volume, which is Volume 1. Um, to have these restored from four, their 4K restorations from the finest surviving elements, there's a whole story. You guys, if you listen to the Warner Archive podcast, which please do, the most recent installment, the most recent episode of the Warner Archive podcast is entirely dedicated to this release. Animation historian Jerry Beck is on to talk about the history of Tex Avery, uh, his time at MGM. These cartoons are MGM cartoons. Uh, what makes it, what's it, what are his trademarks, the surviving materials, where they got this stuff, how these were restored, so educational. I've listened to it twice. It's about 49 minutes long, and I've missed, listened to it twice because it is packed with information. And I'm going to be listening to it again. I, I hung on to the uh, to the podcast so I can revisit it because it's it's super educational. But guys, the uh, the original nitrates, the you know, nitrate film, as you know from the movie Inglorious Bastards, highly combustible, uh, and it is lost. There was a fire. The original elements for many of the Tex Avery shorts are gone. So they have gone to the next best thing, which is first and second generation prints of these shorts. And these are restored in 4K and they look good. <laughs> they look really, really good. I've never seen the cartoons look this good before. Uh, and for those of you who are like, is that, the, is that from The Mask? Is that the cartoon that Jim Carrey watches in The Mask? Yes. That, is a, that was a tip of the hat to an, an homage to Tex Avery, who was one of the kings of cartoons. I think if we were to do a Mount Rushmore of cartoons, a lot of people would put Tex Avery on that Mount Rushmore. He might even be the Lincoln Monument. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, these cartoons are just amazing. There's 19 of them. They're divided. There's a, The first page of the cartoon menu is just general cartoons. And then there's a section for Screwy Squirrel, which was... Um, Think about Bugs Bunny, but less <laughs> less redeemable. Just kind of like a, a total agent of chaos. There's no nobility. There's no uh, not a lot of redeeming qualities to Screwy Squirrel. Then there's a whole section of Droopy because it was Tex Avery that really brought Droopy to life and made him uh, the superstar that he is. So now I've also heard a lot of people say, uh, well, you know, there's an old Laserdisc set and uh, there's uh, an old DVD set. Yes. First of all, this cover itself is an homage, in my opinion. No one has told me this. I kind of just think this, but this seems to be um, uh, the DVD, the very loved, beloved French DVD box set of Tex Avery cartoons had a cover very similar to this. I believe this is an homage to that French DVD cover. Uh, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but it's pretty close to it. There's just a few slight differences. And I think that that's really, uh, uh, I don't think it's an accident. Also, we're talking about those laser, laser disc versions from way back in the day. Here's the thing. Until now, most of these cartoons have never been presented on home media uncut. The laser discs cut, edited episodes, that French DVD set also cuts. Here we have restored fully their full running time. Uh, the thing is, they're a little bit, <laughs> they're they're a little bit naughty. They're constantly breaking the fourth wall. These cartoons are so smart. I don't want to over 
uh, emphasize the word genius, but I really do think that Tex Avery's cartoons are genius. They're constantly breaking that fourth wall, talking to the viewer, uh, talking to the audience in the theater, acknowledging that they're cartoons and changing the rules of what a cartoon can do. And that was so revolutionary, so cutting edge, such a breakthrough for the 40s and the 50s uh, to have already been messing with the formula. They're so good. They are laugh out loud funny. They're uh, they're a little bit naughty, but they're delightfully naughty. These are not for children. That's the thing. These uh, theatrical shorts, you know, like Popeye, uh, like so many, like the Looney Tunes, not aimed at children. They were aimed at adults. And if kids saw them, that's fine. It's not like they were adults only, but they were aimed at adults. And so the humor is for adults. And it's, it's really great stuff, you guys. So, uh, we need to support this release. I got to tell you, that podcast that I'm telling you guys about, they say that they had released a Droopy DVD set to test the waters on what a Tex Avery market looked like, and it undersold based on what they were hoping it would sell. It, it, under, it did not meet, uh, did not meet um, their hopes as far as the sales go, but this is our second chance. They said it's because of the positive reception of things like the new Popeye restorations that we've talked about here at Serial at Midnight. Uh, the I, I don't know that they name checked this, but I'm going to say this: the enthusiasm over things like Johnny Quest and the Jetsons animation restoration. Uh, if you saw our best of 2019 video, uh, several Warner uh, Warner Archives animation restorations ended up on our list because they've done fantastic work. This is testing the market once again. This is volume one. One of the reasons they're doing this is because these are still in the process of being restored. This is what's available now. So I would say if you want more Tex Avery 4K restorations uh, on Blu-ray and high definition, we have to support this release. We have to, you can't wait for these things. If you want more, you can't be like, well, I'm gonna wait till this goes on a deep, deep sale. We have to support this if we want more. That's how it works. You vote with your wallet. So I voted for this, I bought this, I picked this up. And I'm so excited about it. I love them. They're so good, you guys. All right, with that out of the way, let's move on to some other stuff. Uh, I wanna talk with you guys about the setup. This is a very, um, highly regarded, that's the word I was looking for. It's a very highly regarded film noir. Um, it's directed by Robert Wise, and it's uh, it's amazing. I've actually done a full review for this, a written review, at serialatmidnight.com. This movie is uh, like a, it's like a, a film class on how to properly do noir. Now, if you've seen Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, which I'm assuming you probably have, uh, the entire Bruce Willis segment kind of in, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The Bruce Willis segment of that movie kind of begins where the setup ends. Uh, I think that the, the, the entire, the, the watch, you follow the, had a watch, and you know where he kept that watch. I think that all of that is kind of an homage to the setup. I think that's Tarantino paying his respects, tipping his hat to the setup and the classic uh, film noir of uh, what year is this? I can't remember. 1949, RKO. You guys, this is so, so good. This originally came out in a box set. I believe it was the Film Noir Collection, Film Noir Collection Volume 1, accompanying such greats as Out of the Past. Uh, and it has, a, it has a commentary with Robert Wise and Martin Scorsese. Uh, Robert Wise, the director. Of course, Mar Robert Wise also directed The Sound of Music, West Side Story, Star Trek, The Motion Picture, uh, he knows a thing or two about making lasting cinema. And he's talking with Marty Scorsese in the commentary for this movie. So it's fantastic stuff to have this in high definition. I'm telling you guys, it's super short. It's an hour and 12 minutes, but it wastes nothing. It is as close as I think a perfect film. Uh, it's as close to perfect as I think a film can get. I adore this movie. Please go check out my review at serialatmidnight.com. I will link to uh, all of the reviews that we mentioned here in the description of this video so you don't have to go hunt. There's also a full review available for Operation Crossbow, which is not necessarily the movie that the poster and the cover art makes it look like it's going to be. By the way, another, I just want to thank Warner Archive for these the covers are almost always the original posters, which I think is classy AF. Uh, love that they represent the the iconic imagery of these movies. Um, this is uh, Sophia Loren, who hit, gets top billing, but she's not in it all that much. It's just she was the biggest star in this movie. Sophia Loren, you guys, uh, the 60s glamour at its best. Uh, George Pappard, 
<laughs> you know. Uh, now, my generation knows George Papard from the A-Team as Hannibal from the A-Team, but of course, he was in many, many great movies, including Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, who else? Uh, Trevor Howard, John Mills. This is a very cool World War II uh, it's a mission movie. It's It predates The Dirty Dozen. And The Dirty Dozen probably has achieved more fame with movie fans over the years uh, after this. But uh, Operation Crossbow did it first. And so it's worth noting that. It's worth respecting this movie for what it did first. Uh, it kind of tells the story. It's a World War II mission. Basically, like Hitler wants to build a rocket so he can long distance bomb, uh, you know, his enemies. And you got to send some guys in behind enemy lines to try to figure out what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how to stop it. So these guys, these uh, this this team of um, there's a Brit you know, George Papard is American, but it's mostly British. Uh, they go deep, deep, deep undercover. I won't spoil any of the details for you, but they are super deep undercover. And I guess just by comparing it to The Dirty Dozen, that kind of tells you a little bit about the movie. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and if you haven't seen The Dirty Dozen, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But uh, this is it's a fantastic movie. I really enjoyed this. It's not... It's not like a rah-rah... Again, this makes it look like a non-stop action movie. It's not really that. It's more of a cerebral... Um, uh, plan. It, 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 it's an execution of the plan. It's a mission from start all the way to the end. And it gets crazy. There's some really crazy stuff in here. But this is really good. If you guys are on the fence about this, definitely check it out. Uh, we're also going to talk about the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is very cool. Also, another review at SerialAtMidnight.com. Uh, this stars Harry Belafonte, you know, the Deo, Daylight Come, Me Want to Go Home, that guy. Uh, Inger Stevens and Mel Ferrer. Ferrer, uh, as uh, it's basically it's it's about a guy who's working down in a mine. Harry Belafonte, uh, folk singer, civil rights activist, Harry Belafonte, and uh, something happens while he's down there. And when he comes up, he he manages to the mine crumbles on him. He gets trapped down in there, and he was down, he's down there for days. When he finally manages to escape and to free himself, he is alone. And it's kind of like um, you know it predates. The Last Man on Earth, and I'm not talking about the show with Will Forte, January Jones. Uh, I'm talking about the um, the the Vincent Price. Hey, Vincent Price, this is a total accident. Um, I'm talking about the Vincent Price, The Last Man on Earth. That's based on the Richard Matheson short story, I Am Legend. Of course, the Will Smith they adapted it with Will Smith as well. But that that adaptation is such a departure from the source material, in my opinion. Uh, the Vincent Price movie is really where it's at for me. The Omega Man, also. Same story, same uh, adaptation of the same story. But it's kind of that same thing. It's just this guy who's like alone. and He's alone in the world. But as you can tell from the cover of the uh, of the Blu-ray, there are a couple of other people out there that he happens to meet up with. And it's really about humanity. It's about... Um, and I don't necessarily mean humanity in a good way. It's uh, the title is the world, the flesh, and the devil. So it tells you kind of what uh, the, the movie has some things on its mind, and it does it, it achieves it achieves a lot of what I think it's trying to do. But the cinematography is great. They somehow managed to film a lot of scenes in New York City with uh, like no people, and some of it's matte painting, some of it's not. It's just a really impressive undertaking as far as movies go. And the score is amazing. Uh, I noted in my review of this, my full written review. By the way, you know, if you're only relying on the channel to get your reviews for stuff like this, we go way, way deeper at SerialAtMidnight.com. I can't spend, you know, 30 minutes on every title, but we go super deep on these titles. And I noted in my review that uh, the score, the soundtrack, has a, it's really fantastic. It's haunting. And they've Warner Archive has wisely selected this particular piece of music for the menu. And as it just kind of... Uh, you know, loops. It's it's this long loop. I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes, something like that. Haunting. It's absolutely haunting, guys. This is a really cool movie. Uh, next, we're going to talk about Underwater with Jane Russell. I love this movie. I had such a good time with this movie. Um, it, you know, it's always a day. Like I don't want to oversell you on this because it's not that these movies are like it's not. Well, it's not like oh, it's it's like Star Wars. Like it, th these are not necessarily like huge blockbuster home run movies. They're just cool studio pictures that have just disappeared off the face of the earth for decades. And that's the case with uh, Underwater. Jane Russell gets top billing. Jane Russell had just come off of uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes with Marilyn Monroe. She was a big big deal at this era in the fifties. This is uh, nineteen fifty four. And guess what? This is directed by the great. 
John Sturgis, the man who, a bad day at Black Rock. That's my, I would recommend that first for your John Sturgis uh, fix. Uh, and then this came out like right after, I think this was his next movie after Bad Day at Black Rock. Once again, full review at serial at midnight.com. But uh, it's about these treasure hunters, these divers, they're they, like deep sea divers. They go out in the water, they look where ships have sunk, like in the 1600s, sank, sunk, sink, sink, sunk. Uh, and they dive down to see if they can find gold or treasure or anything like that that they can bring up and salvage and sell. And so it's kind of, sort of, um, maybe an early influence of an Indiana Jones kind of movie. It's about uh, these people who go hunting for treasure deep under the water. And there's a lot of stuff out there, you guys. There's sharks. There's There are pirates. There's, uh, I don't mean like, I, matey, like not that kind of pirates, but like Captain Phillips kind of pirates. Um, and uh, it's just a really fun adventure movie. You know, what I said in my review uh, at SerialAtMidnight.com about this is it feels like a B movie with A level talent and production because John Sturgis is no B movie director. John Sturgis is a big honking deal, and uh, the cast here is also a great deal uh, or a big deal. And what it does is like with with all this underwater cinematography. Um, at the time when this came out, like it was not super common yet. Uh, by the time of like you know. Uh, Thunderball. That's the one. I, the, the James Bond movie Thunderball. And he's like on and on with all the underwater photography. But this movie did it first, uh, like way before Thunderball. This was kind of at the beginning of that movement of um, an adventure movie, like bringing the audience to a place that you can't just go. You know, you can't just go deep underwater in 1954. You have to really rely on the magic of the movies. And, and this is a lot of fun. And they. Have completely done you know, all these movies are restored. They would not put them out on Blu-ray if they weren't restored. But it looks so good. Again, 4K restoration. I believe in the Warner Archive podcast where they discuss this release. They say it's the first time that it's been in its original aspect ratio since the theatrical showing in the 50s. I believe that's what they say. So most of its life, it's been cropped, um, which is really, really a shame because this movie was meant to be seen big. It's a big picture, you guys. I'll tell you what's not necessarily a big picture, but is a lot of fun is <laughs> Penelope. Now, yes, look at that cover. Let's let's all just look at the cover, and we can just say um, Warner Archive has preserved the cover. It's probably not very politically correct right now, but I appreciate them for preserving history. It's very clear what this movie's trying to do. This is a '60s, a swinging '60s comedy about uh, Penelope, who is played by Natalie Wood. Natalie Wood is a well. Penelope is uh, she's kind of bored in her marriage, and so her husband owns a bank. Owns a bank, and she just decides like I'm just going to be a thief. I'm going to rob my husband's bank. So she becomes this like master criminal. But uh, it's all just for fun. It's all just for you know. No one gets hurt. No one gets shot. Nothing like that. It's a comedy, and because it's the '60s, it's cheeky in every sense of that word. Uh, and I I love stuff like this. It's just. Fun. Fun. It's not mean spirited. It's just fun. Some of it has aged, uh, especially in today's ultra PC time. Some of it has been. Some of it might raise some eyebrows, but I think it's really great. And Natalie Wood is fantastic. You want to talk about a star? Uh, Natalie Wood, one of our greatest golden age of Hollywood stars. You know, she was in a miracle on 34th street as a child and then West side story. Hey, Robert wise. And then uh, all the way through the fifties, through the sixties, Natalie Wood also one of the most tragic stars and her story has not fully been told, but I think her story, uh, there's justice coming for Natalie Wood in the next, the, the coming months, the coming years. Um, now the, the book is not closed on Natalie Wood. And thanks to Warner archive for giving us these uh, these deep catalog titles that star people like Natalie Wood. You know who else is in this movie is Peter Falk, Columbo, Peter Falk. Also, you know, some so many of you guys might be like, I don't know Columbo, but I know The Prince's Bride, and I know that Grandpa, Fred Savage's Grandpa, is like, hey, maybe this is a kissing book. That guy, that's 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 uh, Peter Falk, who I love, is Columbo, and he was always Columbo. Every movie that I watch him in, he's basically doing what would later become Columbo. He's like, you know, I just can't help but think that maybe I got this thing all figured out but there's something i can't wrap my head around and maybe you can help me figure it out that is just his lovable clumsy but smarter than you think he is uh so i don't know i had a lot of fun with this one 
And then last, but certainly not least, I want to talk about Two on a Guillotine. Now, this is directed by William Conrad, uh, who um, I think a lot of people will know from his, uh, he was a star of a TV show in the 80s, uh, Canon, if you remember Canon. And uh, he did, these are kind of like William Castle movies that William Castle did not direct or produce. And Connie Stevens is in this movie. Connie Stevens, who uh, I think some of you guys, as a B movie fans, might know her from Scorchy, you know, Scorchy from the 70s. Um, but uh, it's got Dean Jones before uh, his Disney. This is right before his Disney era. You know, Dean Jones from. <laughs> I was going to name Disney, but like all of the 60s Disney movies, I think Dean Jones is in. And Cesar Romero, the Joker from the 60s Batman series. Uh, is in this movie as well. And it's really fun. It's really creepy. It's kind of a... Okay, the premise of the movie is that Cesar Romero is a magician, like a stage magician. And part of his act is that he kills his wife every night. And then something goes horribly, horribly wrong. And he really does kill his wife on stage. And then we pick up the story. That's the prologue. And then we pick up the story years later. The daughter, his daughter, has grown up. And also, his wife is played by Connie Stevens, and the daughter is played by Connie Stevens. So it's the the mom is barely in the movie, but the daughter, the grown up daughter, Connie Stevens version, is where the story kind of picks up. And so she's inherited his house, the, the house of magic, you know, and uh, she gets the inheritance if she can spend the night in the house for a certain amount of nights there's like stipulations if she can do it then uh, she gets it all man and so it's it's a haunted house story it's a, you know that kind of a thing it's like a spooky house it's like a creep the it's an old dark house movie with comedy but it's got a lot of legitimate I don't want to call them scares, but just spooky atmosphere. It's very much having fun with that 60s atmosphere. If you guys like The Ghost of Mr. Chicken 2 on a guillotine, it's kind of a kindred spirit with that movie. Uh, but I don't know. I had a really good time with it. And it's black and white, and it is gorgeously filmed in black and white. The uh, the scenery, they go to the, you know, now it's the Santa Monica Pier. The, 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 there's the roller coaster and all these rides and stuff. It wasn't that at this time, but that's where it was. It was filmed on location at what is now the Santa Monica Pier with all those carnival attractions and stuff. Uh, it is a really cool movie. It's campy. It's uh, so What year is this? It is 1964. So Black and White in 64, that was the deliberate choice. They were going for something. Uh, and I think they achieved it. This is a ton of fun. And if you like mid-60s stuff, and I know so many of you guys do, The Monsters, The Addams Family, uh, that sort of thing, tiki culture, hot rod culture, this is a good fit for that. There's a lot of those elements here. It really feels, it's got that mid, mid-60s mid kitschy, campy thing, and I, <laughs> I love it. Um, seven Nights of Fiendish Fun, any way you slice it. It's a good, uh, good tagline. So guys, that's going to do it for this Warner Archive Spotlight. These are the movies that we've talked about during this video. And I think this is the one that so many of you guys are going to be looking for. So I'm going to put uh, a purchase link to this in the description of this video so you do not have to go look or hunt to find it. And uh, guys, we got to support this release. Support all of these releases, anything that you're interested in. Definitely support them and uh, tell them Serial and Midnight sent you. So guys, thanks for hanging out and talking about Warner Archive, all of these amazing releases from the label. Uh, there's more cool stuff coming out all the time. So we will uh, just keep your eyes peeled to SerialAtMidnight.com and to our social media because we are always sharing reviews of the latest releases. Guys, thanks again. Take care. And until next time, I will catch you later.